Well, good morning, Kingsland. My name is Chris Kincaid, and I'm one of the student pastors on staff, and I am so excited to be here with y'all this morning. So I grew up playing baseball from the time I was four years old until I graduated high school. And going into my freshman year of high school, I made the freshman team and I started that whole first season that I I was on the freshman team. Um, But as I got older, I got moved up to varsity and the level of competition got greater. um, And that relegated me to the bench, which meant I did not see the field very often. Now, I don't know if you know much about bench players in baseball, but um, their heads are not usually in the game and they're preoccupied with other things, serious business. Like how many pieces of double bubble can you possibly fit in your mouth and how big of a bubble can you make and make it pop all over the place? It's pretty awesome. Um, Maybe filling as many cups of sunflower seeds up as possible. My record is 10 in a game. And so I challenge you to beat that. Actually, I don't encourage you to do that. You shouldn't do that. Or maybe when your team's losing, you're trying to make a rally cap, which is you find as many ways as possible to fit a ridiculous or put your hat on as ridiculously as possible. um, And maybe you'll get some luck and maybe you'll win the game. It actually has no effect on the game, but mentally it's fun to think it does. Or maybe you break out the Gatorade cups and you cut out the bottom and you make the binoculars and you're watching your team and when they make an error, you razz them and make fun of them and have a good time. Needless to say, my head was not in the game. But going into my junior year, I had the opportunity to start at first base for eight games. And I took that bench player mentality of of being goofy and silly and not really paying attention to the game into the game with me. And I got away with it the first four or five games. I played pretty well. The level of competition was a little bit lower, and so I was able to get away with it. Uh, But we entered into district play, and let me say, you can't have that mentality and compete with top-level competition. It doesn't work. And so the last two games I started, I struck out a combined eight times in two games. If you don't know what that means, if you're not familiar with baseball, that is really, really bad. (laughs) And so as quickly as I rose into the starting lineup, I was yanked right back to the bench and found myself out of the game and not paying attention, just like I was before. Fast forward to the end of the season, we're warming up and getting ready to go and and taking uh, fly balls and infield. I'm at my usual spot at first base, and our starting center fielder gets the great idea to dive and try and catch a ball. You don't dive in warm-ups. I don't know what he was thinking or doing, but he did it anyways. And so he dives, and he misses the ball, and he separates his shoulder. Yeah, that's not good. And so our starting left fielder shifts, shifts to center field, but that leaves a gap in left field. And all of us are going back into the dugout or wondering, hmm, who's going to play in left field? Mind you, I've never played outfield in my life. I had never played outfield in my life until that point. So I haven't taken many fly balls. I don't know how to play outfield. I have no clue what's going on. So I'm like, I think I'm safe. I'm going to be good over here on the bench. So the coach goes to the starting lineup and he gets to the ninth batter. And I'm like, I'm good. I'm I'm not going to go in the field. It'll be okay. And uh, he goes, batting ninth is going to be Chris Kincaid in left field. And my jaw drops. I'm like, did he just say my name in left field? Because <laughs> that does not make sense. And he said it again, Chris Kincaid, you're in left field and you're batting ninth. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to grab my glove. And I trot out there to left field. And the whole time I'm out there, I'm just praying to God. I'm like, God, <laughs> please don't let them hit me a ball. Please, please, please don't let them hit me a ball. And baseball has a really funny way of working. Because if you don't want the ball, the ball is going to find you. That works that way in any sport. If you have that mentality, if I don't want the ball, guess what? The ball will find you and it's going to expose you. And so I was out there, the first, the first two batters strike out, but that third batter comes up and he just rocks a ball down the left field line. And I'm like, I got to go get this, I guess. And so I, I take off running and I'm moving towards the ball, get a little closer to it. And I'm like, I think I can catch this ball. Take a few more steps, I'm running. I'm like, I think I got this. And so um, I, I go down and I, I had to slide to catch it. And so I slide and you're thinking I missed the ball. But I slide and I catch it and I pop up and I open the glove and I look in it and there's a ball. And, I, <laughs> and I'm like, I just caught that. I've never played left field in my life. That's pretty good. And I'm, I'm excited because I just had an impact on the game, right? And so I trot in the dugout. A couple innings later, I come up to bat and I rope a single up the middle. I get on base and I score a run. A couple innings later, I get another single, score another run. Um, and I go two for three, have a great game. But something changed in me that day. I had always been a bench player. That's all I knew on varsity. My head was out of the game. But as I began to realize that I have an impact on this game, if I play well and if I have my head in it, I, I can actually impact my team's performance and I can make a difference. And that changed me going into the next season, my senior year. So much so that I was willing to do anything to see my team succeed. I won the 110% award, which really what that means is you're not very good at baseball, but man, you give it your very best effort. (laughs) But I was willing to do anything to help my team succeed. I was willing to take the 95 mile an hour fastball off my back so I could get on base and score a run. 
I was willing to lay down the bunt because I was an active participant in the game. I wasn't a bench player anymore. And I think our walks with Christ look very, very similar. So often we're, we're saved and we become believers and we think that we're just sort of living until we go to heaven one day and see God. And God, in actuality, doesn't want us just to sit there and do nothing. He hasn't called us just to sit on the bench. He's called us to go and be a part of the game. He's given each and every single one of us that are in Christ in this room a testimony, a story that points to him and testifies to what he has done and what he is doing in our lives. A testimony is this, a testimony is your evidence of how Jesus has changed your life. And if you're in Christ in this room, you have a testimony. And God has called you off the bench and he has called you into the game. You're an active participant and he wants to use you for his glory and his kingdom. And so today we're going to open up to Acts chapter 22. Acts chapter 22. And we're going to learn a little bit more about Paul. If you're not familiar with Paul, Paul used to be a persecutor of the church. He did not like Christians at all. He actually killed many, many Christians. On top of that, whenever describing himself, he described himself in Philippians as the Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee to a T. He believed that he followed the rules well enough that maybe he could be righteous enough for God. He'd be righteous in God's sight and earn God's favor. And then he enforced other people to do that. Well, as Paul continued to walk and continued to persecute the church and and walk in his religious laws, um, he goes to Damascus. He's actually going to arrest Christians there and put them in jail. And what happens is this bright light flashes. He is blinded and he can't see. And he encounters Jesus of Nazareth on this road. And his life is forever changed. Because he comes into a relationship with Jesus. It's no longer about rules or knowledge. Uh, he now has a relationship with Jesus Christ and the living God. His life's forever changed. And where we pick up in Acts 22, uh, he's been going, he's been ministering to the Gentiles. And many uh, Gentiles have come to faith in Jesus Christ. But mixed in with the Gentiles, there are also Jews who are out there too. And word has now traveled back to Jerusalem. Uh, and it's a rumor that's not true that what Paul has been telling Jewish people to do is to abandon the teachings of Moses that they're worthless and and that that they should no longer do those. When in actuality, what Paul is doing is Paul is saying, hey, those things are good and all, but guess what? Those don't lead to salvation and those don't lead to righteousness. They're not bad things to do necessarily, but those will never save you. Those will never make you righteous in God's sight. They will not justify you. And so there's a misconception going around amongst the Jews in Jerusalem and they're mad at him. They're really upset. And so he comes back to Jerusalem. He goes into the temple and, and, and he goes and he's cleansed and he, he worships there and he comes out and there's an angry mob waiting on him out there. Imagine leaving your place of worship and there's an angry mob waiting on you. And they're angry, one, because they think they've been tell, he's been telling Jews to abandon the teachings of Moses. Two, there's another rumor that's not true being spread around that he brought two Gentiles into the temple, thus making the temple unclean. So now we have angry mob on our hand who wants to kill him. And so they apprehend him and they start beating him and mocking him. And it gets so bad that a Roman commander has to step in and pull Paul away so that he doesn't die. And so they pull Paul away and they're leading him away. And he, said, he speaks to the Roman commander in Greek and he says, hey, uh, can I talk to these people that were just beating me actually? Just like real quick, can I have a conversation with them? And that's where we pick up here. In Acts 22 verse 1, it says this, brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense before you. When they heard that he was addressing them in Aramaic, they became even quieter. He continued, I am a Jew born in Tarshish in Cilicia, brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel according to the strictness of our ancestral law. I was zealous for God, just as all of you are today. I persecuted this way to the death, arresting and putting both men and women in jail, as both the high priest and the whole council of elders can testify about me. After I received letters from them to the brothers, I traveled to Damascus to arrest those who were there and bring them to Jerusalem to be punished. So Paul stops the Roman commander and says, hey, can I talk to these people? And he turns to the people that were just beating him and he proceeds to start sharing his testimony. He starts sharing his testimony. And I think this is where we see the first action from Paul that we can imitate, and it's this, that we need to share from love. We need to share our testimony from a heart of love. The reason, the evidence I see that, that Paul shared from a heart of love is like, who would talk to someone that was just beating them and want them to know about how he received salvation? Like who does that? That can only come from a motivation of love. Not only that, but we see the language that he uses here. He starts speaking to them in Aramaic. He's been speaking in Greek prior to this, but he meets the people where they're at and starts speaking to them in their native tongue. 
what was familiar to them and what they know. And that draws them in like, hey, he's speaking to us in Aramaic. He understands us. And not only that, the familial language that he uses, he addresses them as brothers and fathers. That's an endearing term. They're not like foreign to him. They're people that he like, he's like, I want to have a relationship with you. I love you and I care about you. So he's drawing them in. The other evidence that I see here for, for Paul sharing from a heart of love is, is this, is that he doesn't view himself as better than these people. He doesn't look down upon them because they're not followers of Jesus. In fact, what he does is he says, I was no different than you. He says, I was once zealous for the law, just as you were. I understand where you're coming from. I understand where you're at because I was no different. I was the same. In fact, I was so not different that I actually persecuted and killed many Christians because I held the same viewpoints that you did. And so he doesn't share from a place of arrogance. He doesn't share from a heart of, of anger, frustration. He shares from a heart of love. And there's only one way, there's only one possible way that he could do that. It's because he knew Jesus Christ as Lord. You see, if we look all throughout the Gospels, throughout the book of Matthew specifically, where I see is Jesus moving in the direction of people. You see, uh, all throughout prior to Matthew chapter 9, Jesus is going and he's healing people and casting out demons and sharing the good news of the kingdom of God. He, he's sharing about it. And we get this snapshot in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, of Jesus' heart and who he is, what his character is, what is his mind, what is his, what is his mindset going into this. It says in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, that he sees this crowd in front of them and he looks at them and he has compassion on them because they are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. That word compassion means that he was moved deeply towards them. He deeply loved and cared about those people and he deeply loves and cares about Paul and he deeply loves and cares about us. That is the story of the gospel is God's love for us. That's the basis of it. And Paul had experienced that love. And we see that Paul's motivation was love in this. Romans chapter five, he says this. He says, for while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for a just person, though for a good person, perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Paul shared from a heart of love because he recognized the only reason he was that day was because of the love that he had experienced in Jesus Christ. That while he was dead in his sins, while he was persecuting the church, while he was trying to make himself righteous enough for God, Jesus still went to the cross and died for him because of his love for him. And our stories look the exact same. While we were dead in our sins and distant from God, God showed love for us and that Christ died for us and that changes everything. And so how could we not share our testimony from a heart of love? Because our very story is based upon God's love for us. And so it's important that we share from a heart of love when we share our story. If we continue on, as Paul shares his testimony, he says he's going to Damascus and he's about to go and arrest these believers. And what happens is this bright light flashes and he's blinded and he can't see anymore. And it says here in Acts chapter 22, verse 7, I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I answered, who are you, Lord? He said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, the one you're persecuting. And so Paul is going to arrest Christians and persecute them. And what happens is he encounters the living Jesus Christ. He goes on, he asks him the question, what should I do? Where should I go? And Jesus tells him, you need to go into Damascus. And he goes into Damascus and he encounters this man named Ananias. And what Ananias does is Ananias shares the gospel with him. And I says to him, the God of our ancestors has appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one and hear the words from his mouth. What God wanted for Paul that day is for him to know Jesus Christ and have a relationship with him. That was what Paul, that's what God wanted for Paul. So Ananias shares the gospel with him and Paul is forever changed. And he goes and he gets baptized, his sins are washed away and he goes to proclaim uh, the kingdom of God to many, many people. But his life is forever changed. I think the second action that we can see as Paul shares his testimony is that he points to Jesus as he shares his testimony. His testimony was never about him. It was never about the bright light that he saw. 
It wasn't about Ananias. It was about Jesus working through that and him encountering the living God. That, that is what it was fully about. In my 25 years of being a Christ follower, um, I, I have fallen into the trap of believing myths about testimonies and about sharing them. Sometimes we label testimonies as good or bad, boring or exciting. We can make testimonies all about us and we can forget about Jesus. We point to our experiences rather than pointing to the God that actually uses those experiences to change us and transform us. And so I just want to quickly look at these myths that we sometimes believe. And the first one is this, is that my testimony isn't good. We believe this myth that my testimony isn't good. If I had a dollar for every single time I heard that in student ministry, I would be a millionaire now. <laughs> and what's sad is that I really can't make fun of anyone because I did the same thing. And I sometimes believe that lie. So often we think, well, I don't have any of these exciting moments. My testimony is really boring. I didn't have this exciting time where uh, I came to know Christ or nothing crazy has ever happened in my life. And so therefore my story of coming to know Jesus, it's boring or it's not good. When we say that, we are minimizing the power of the gospel and the depth of sin from which we were saved. Our destination was separation from God apart from Jesus Christ. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, but now we are made alive in Christ. And that is nothing short of miraculous. So there's no such thing as a good testimony or a bad testimony, a boring or an exciting one. They are all miraculous in nature because we were brought from death to life, from a slave to sin to free in Christ. That, that is our story. That is who we are. And so don't believe that lie. Don't believe that myth. The second myth that we can believe is this, is that my testimony is about my story. It's about me. It's about how bad I was and now I'm good. And so let's focus on how bad I was. And now let's focus how good I am. And we miss the very mark of we were not able to save ourselves. It's only through Jesus Christ that that can happen. Or we can fall on the opposite end of that spectrum of my story's not exciting. I don't possess the abilities to share it. I'm not a good speaker. I'm really, really shy. And so we don't share our testimony with anyone because we minimize the power of the gospel and we make it about ourselves too. I fell into that trap whenever I was a kid. I can remember being a seventh grader. I was 13 years old. I was sitting in that back corner of the worship center, probably right where Sammy Abu's sitting right now. I was sitting right in that chair. And you know what? I can remember Pastor Alex Kennedy being on the stage. And he was preaching. I love Pastor Alex. He had a huge impact on my life. But as he preached, I remember thinking to myself, there is no possible way that God could ever use me like that. There's no way. I'm too shy. I'm scared to speak in front of people. My story's boring. I don't know enough about the gospel to tell people about it. I came up with every single excuse in the world as to why I couldn't share my testimony or share the gospel. And I believed those lies for a really long time. I was finally freed from that in college when I began to realize that my testimony was never about me. It was never about anything I had done. It was never about anything I could do. It was never about my abilities. It was never about any of that. What it was about was that Jesus Christ had saved me from my sin and apart from him, I am nothing. And so whenever I share, it's not about me. It's about me pointing to him and all that he's done in my life. That's what it's about. That's the only reason that that 13-year-old kid that sat in the corner of the worship center and, and now can stand on the stage today, the only reason I can stand here today is because of the work and the grace of Jesus Christ. That's it. And guess what? That's not just for me. That's for each and every single person in this room and online. God wants to use you and your story, your testimony to point to him and share about what Jesus has done. So our testimony is not about us. The third thing is this, myth number three that we believe, and you may raise your eyebrows at this, is that my experiences transform me. So often we fall into the trap of believing that a person, a place, or a thing is what brings about transformation in our life. But the reality is that's only possible through God using those experiences to transform us. It was not the experience in and of itself that transformed you. It was God working through it. And so I'm not saying your experiences are worthless, but I'm saying apart from God, transformation does not happen. It is not possible. A few years ago, I was on a mission trip and we were uh, sharing the gospel and our students were sharing their testimonies. And I love that. I love when students share their testimonies. It's one of my favorite things um, because it takes boldness to get in front of people and share what God is doing in your life. But as um, the students were sharing their testimonies, something struck me as odd that day. I heard about how they were baptized at a young age and came to Christ. And then all of a sudden, when they showed up at Kingsland, everything got better. 
Or when they started going to this life group, everything changed. It was the life group that changed them. Or th- this person that they met, this person is what changed them. And um, not that there's anything wrong with sharing about how your experiences have helped you. It helps people seek those things out. But as the kids were listening to our students share their testimonies, I think we missed giving them one thing. And it was the very thing that could save them and transform them. That's Jesus Christ. You see, those kids in Dallas, Texas, they're never going to experience Kingsland Baptist Church. They're probably never going to get to a life group. They may never get to meet the person that you're talking about, but you want to know the one thing that they can know about and hear about is Jesus Christ. And so it was never about our experiences in and of themselves. It was about God using those experiences to change us and transform us. And so as we share our stories, if we're just pointing to the experience, we're not pointing people to the truth of the gospel. We have to point to Jesus in the midst of those experiences. It's all about pointing to Jesus. As we continue on in this passage in Acts chapter 22, Paul wraps up his testimony. I think this is where we see our third action that we can imitate from Paul as we share our testimonies. It says this in verse 17, After I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him telling me, Hurry and get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. But I said, Lord, they know that in in synagogue after synagogue, I had those who believed in you imprisoned and beaten. And when the blood of your witness, Stephen, was being shed, I stood there giving approval and guarding the clothes of those who killed him. He said to me, go, because I will send you far away to the Gentiles. They listened to him up to this point. Then they raised their voices shouting, wipe this man off the face of the earth. He should not be allowed to live. So Paul begins to, he shares his testimony shares it from a place of love. He points to Jesus and he's met with this. He's met with being told, wipe this man off the face of the earth. He does not be, he's not allowed to be lived or he should not be allowed to live. Man, can you imagine you sharing your testimony and loving these people deeply and the response to it is this, we want you dead. Can you imagine that? And I want to ask you a question right now. Did Paul fail in this moment? Did Paul miss the mark? Was this purposeless? No one came to know Christ in this moment. Just think about it. I want to read you this quote by Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon says this, We are not responsible to God for the souls that are saved, but we are responsible for the gospel that is preached and for the way in which we preach it. I don't believe that Paul failed on this day. You see, Paul was not responsible for the salvation of of those souls that day. We are not responsible for the salvation of any souls. Thank you, God, that we're not. But what we are responsible is for being obedient to preach the gospel in the manner in which we preach it. We are obedient to share our stories and, and the way in which we share them with people. That's what we are called to do. But We're not called to save anyone. And so Paul in this moment is a great success because he is obedient to proclaim about who Jesus is and point people to him. But we as Americans, I know myself especially, I'm incredibly competitive. And I like numbers. I like seeing success. I like all of that stuff. But as I've gotten older and as I've worked with junior high boys, the more I've realized is that uh, they barely remember what happened 15 minutes ago, much less what I preached in a sermon a week ago. I can be sharing something awesome from my testimony and uh, they raise their hand, one of them does, and, and you think, oh, this is going to be a good question. I'm so excited for this. And the question is, hey, can I go to the bathroom? So you, you're killing me. But guess what? It was never about that. I don't share my testimony. I don't share the gospel for an instant reaction. I share it with the hope that God will use it one day in someone's life uh, to further his kingdom and so that people can find the hope that is found in Jesus Christ. That's why we share our testimonies. That's why Paul was able to share here. I think Paul was able to entrust the outcome to God. I think he saw that in his own life. You know, he references Stephen in this passage. I don't know if y'all know who Stephen is, but Stephen was was killed. He was a martyr. He was murdered for his faith. He was preaching the gospel and he had stone after stone after stone thrown at him until he died. Stephen didn't see an altar call. He didn't see a bunch of people come to faith in Christ. He didn't get to see any of that. He was just killed for his faith. But obviously what Stephen did that day had such an impact on Paul that that became a part of Paul's testimony. 
He was able to entrust the outcome to God because he watched Stephen do that before him. What Paul recognizes that it wasn't about him to save anyone. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul talks about how we are called to scatter seed, we are called to water, but only God can grow. Only God can do that. But we are called to scatter seed and we are called to water. We're called to be obedient to do that. A couple weeks ago, I had the opportunity to go out to Brookshire, Texas. And we took our students out there, took about 200 students and leaders out there. And um, we got to do a lot of fun work. We got to paint houses and we got to do kids, uh, a kids club, a Bible club thing. We were out at Mana House. We were partnering at the hangar. We were pressure washing stuff. It was an awesome week. And I had the gift of getting to paint houses primarily with sixth and seventh grade boys. Now, I don't know if you've done that before, um, but it is an adventure. And let me say, each and every single day, those boys got better at painting houses and they did a really good job. But that last day, we're at our house and we're painting and doing it, we're wrapping up. And I noticed this car kind of swerve over to the side of the road in front of our house. I'm like, uh oh, what is that? And this dude gets out and he asks all the kids and the leaders, who's in charge here? And they all kind of look at each other and they all point at me. <laughs> I'm like, I hope this isn't about one of the bad paint jobs that we did because we really tried our very best. <laughs> and, um, and they weren't all bad. They were really good. But anyway, so he comes over and he gathers us together. He says, hey, can I, can I talk to her real quick? I was like, sure, absolutely. He said, my name is Alan and I've been alive for 56 years. I've been in Brookshire for 53 of those years. He said, I have never in my life out here seen this many people in our community showing us that we matter. 53 years in Berkshire, Texas, that's like 15 minutes away from us, if that. Never seen that many people letting them know that they care, that they matter, that they have worth and value. And he looked at us and he said, thank you. Thank you, because this impacted me today. And not only does this impact me, it's impacted our community, it's impacted the people around us. I didn't know that was happening. Our kids didn't know that was happening as they're leading a Bible club, as they're working over at Manor House. They didn't know the impact that they're having. They never will, and we never will. And that's not why we serve. We point to Jesus with the hopes of, through our testimony, with the hopes that God will use that. And that people will find the same hope that we found in Jesus Christ. That's why we do that. That's why we share our story. One of my favorite verses in all of Scripture is 1 Peter 2.9. And it says this, that we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession that we would proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of the darkness and into the marvelous light. Your life's purpose is one, to know God and have a relationship with him, but then two, is to proclaim about all that he has done and all that he is doing in your life to tell other people about how he has brought you in from the darkness and into the marvelous light. That is your purpose. That is what you and I are called to do. We get to do that every single day of our life. And what a gift that is. That you have the opportunity to let people know about the hope that they can have in Jesus Christ because you've experienced that yourself. I mean, we all sit in this room today He is one of the work of the Holy Spirit, but two, the obedience of many men and women to faithfully share their testimonies and point to Jesus Christ. That's why we sit here today. And to think that you have that same opportunity to impact generations to come. That someone five, 10, 50, hundreds of years from now could be impacted because of your obedience to testify to what God has done in your life. That is what happens whenever you share your story and you point to Jesus Christ. He wants to use you for his kingdom. He wants to use you for his kingdom. I think it's a matter of, are we going to allow him to do that? Are we going to leave the bench and stop being a bench player and become an active participant in the game? So I want to ask you today, some of you in this room, you may not know Jesus Christ. I want you just to think, like, why don't I know him? Maybe it's because I thought I was about following a list of rules. Maybe I thought that if I do enough things, I can become righteous enough for God. And I don't know who Jesus is. I don't have a relationship with him. Let me tell you today that he wants relationship with you. God loved you so much that he sent his son Jesus to come and die for your sins and my sins so uh, so that we could have a relationship with him. He loves you and he cares deeply. And that's here for you today. And if you want to talk about that, if you want relationship with God, if you want a testimony, 
There are going to be people standing up here at the front that would love to talk with you about that and pray with you. For some of you in this room, maybe you've thought that your best spiritual days are behind you. Maybe you thought, man, college was awesome. That's when I really walked closely with Christ, but I have nothing else before me. Or maybe your best spiritual days are in high school. Let me tell you, that's a lie. I believe that in Christ, our best spiritual days are ahead of us. Why? Because God is shaping us and molding us to look more like Jesus through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So day by day, step by step, we look more and more like Jesus. And I believe that our best spiritual days are ahead of us if we are in Christ. And God wants to take you off that bench. He wants you to become an active participant in the game. He wants to use you for his glory and his kingdom. So I want to challenge you as you go home today, after you get a good lunch and take a nice nap, I want you to spread around your house as a family or with your friends or whatever it looks like. And I just want you to write out your story. And I want you to share with your family or with your friends about all that God has done and all that God is doing in your life. Write out your testimony and share that with one another. And if you've already done that, let's imitate Paul and let's go and start sharing with love. Let's point to Jesus and then let's entrust the outcome to God regardless of what happens. I believe that God's going to use that for his kingdom and his glory. I believe he already is. But let's be a people that point to Jesus and share our testimonies about all he has done. I'm going to pray and then you respond as you feel led. God, thank you so much for this day. I thank you, God, that you um, have sent your son, Jesus, God, because you love us so much. God, I thank you um, that you use broken people like us, God, for your kingdom and that you're uh, restoring us and healing us day by day, step by step. And God, I pray uh, as, we, um, as we leave here today, God, that we would leave here changed. And God, I pray that we would respond honestly and openly, God, um, as your spirit leads us. For it's in your awesome and holy name I pray, amen.